Well, I'm glad to see you all in the flesh as opposed to on a video screen. Um, I, uh, what I plan to do today is to uh, finish up the discussion, the overview of gravity wave sources, which is the tail end of my general overview. And then I will uh, do a very fast introduction to general relativity. And those of you who feel very comfortable with general relativity theory, you uh, will probably want to leave after I finish the overview of sources. Um, then on Wednesday, I will do a fairly fast uh, introduction to gravitational wave theory. And then we'll start uh, doing something with it uh, next week. So, so that's the plan. Are there any questions before we start? Your copies of the uh, I don't have, do you have copies of the handout from last time? Yeah, in my office. In his office. So, so you can ask for them from me, hi. I, uh, have we put the uh, slides from last time on the web? They're on the web as a PowerPoint file? Okay, so I will uh, send it through uh, a distiller and turn it into a PDF file, which is probably easier for most people to work with. I'll try to do that uh, uh, tonight or tomorrow. The other questions? And then I will uh, <coughs> return to what I was doing from England uh, on Wednesday. A oh, what is it? What's going on here? There we go. So I was discussing or giving an overview of uh, gravitational wave sources, a little bit about their phenomenology, uh, about techniques for computing the waveforms they emit, uh, and uh, uh, and I want to continue going through that. So I had talked about the inspiral of compact bodies into massive black holes in galactic nuclei and uh, the science that we would hope to do with that in terms of mapping space-time curvature uh, around a quiescent black hole and testing various things from, from uh, black hole theory. I also talked about the inspiral and merger of binary black holes and again testing various things from, uh, from black hole theory. A third source that we will be going after, in this case, uh, just in the case of uh, Earth-based gravity wave detectors, LIGO and its partners, is neutron star black hole mergers. So this is a binary system made of a black hole and a companion neutron star. Uh, the black hole would have a mass of a few solar masses up to a few tens of solar masses. <coughs> masses. Neutron stars, all known neutron stars, have masses of approximately 1.4 solar masses. So they, they could go on down to masses as low as 0.1 solar masses in principle. Uh, the astrophysical phenomenology of this source is that uh, these kinds of black hole neutron star binaries are thought to form through the evolution of main sequence binaries in the field, that is in uh, galaxies, in the general body of galaxies. Uh, when one star collapses and forms a black hole, and the other star then collapses and forms a neutron star. Uh, they also are thought to occur as capture binaries in globular clusters. Globular clusters are clusters that uh, typically contain of order a million stars. That, uh, they live in galaxies and in the halos of galaxies, such as our own galaxy. And they have a much higher density of uh, stars than you have normally in the field. And in globular clusters, neutron stars and black holes would gradually sink toward the center of the globular cluster through a process uh, called tidal friction that uh, we will discuss a bit about later. And uh, then would find each other, capture each other and uh, into a binary. And then uh, the binary would evolve by gradually spiraling the other under the emission of gravitational radiation reaction. Uh, for a uh, ri wide range of uh, masses of, and spins of the black hole and neutron star, before the neutron star reaches the horizon of the black hole, it may be torn apart by the tidal gravitational field of the black hole. 
And I'll uh, be discussing tidal gravitational fields a little bit later today and how they're equivalent to space-time curvature. So it's the space-time curvature of the black hole that tears the neutron star apart. And uh, so we're going to be interested in studying that so-called tidal disruption of the neutron star. Uh, this source uh, ha lies in a high frequency band, as I said, and so you go after it with LIGO and its partners. The estimated event rates uh, from Vicky Calagera uh, uh, look, surveying the whole literature and uh, looking at all the estimates that have been made, uh, she gives, uh, suggests that at the distance to which uh, the initial interferometers in LIGO can see this source, which is 43 megaparsecs, that uh, the event rate should be between one every 25 years and 2,500 years and one every two years. So as with other sources, uh, the first interferometers sit at a point where the event rate estimates should, must be at the upper end of the conventional uh, astrophysicist's uh, range in order for us to see it. But the, after the first upgrade, the advanced interferometers is currently envisioned would see out to 650 megaparsecs where the rate would be between one a year and four a day. And so as is the case for a number of other sources, uh, we have high confidence of seeing this after the upgrade. We have to be a little lucky in order to see it uh, before the upgrade. But then I remind you of what I said uh, I, last week, and that is that astrophysicists have a lousy track record, a very poor track record of predicting uh, things like event rates and what's going to be seen when a radically new window opens up under the universe. But this, this is uh, what the predictions are. Information carried by the waves from the in-spiral uh, waves, one can infer as we will work out uh, in detail later in the course, the masses, the spins, and the orbit, whether it's a circular orbit or non-circular, for the uh, binary. And then uh, one can just hit the, yeah. And then one can uh, infer the neutron star structure, for example, the radius of the neutron star, from the uh, tidal disruption gravitational waves. And from the neutron star structure, we can infer information about the equation of state of matter and the, uh, that makes up the bulk of the neutron star. And neutron stars, uh, in neutron stars, a large fraction of the matter is at densities of something like 10 times nuclear density, so we don't really understand the equation of state at all well. So one of the goals of LIGO is to do nuclear physics through neutron star black hole scattering. Uh, but where we don't have control of the accelerator that uh, produces the scattering, but we do have a, a very good readout system. Uh, the methods of, anal of computing the gravitational waves from uh, this source, the inspiral waves are computed by post-Newtonian expansions. So this is expansions then in the orbital velocity divided by the speed of light and simultaneously in the strength of the gravitational field. The tidal disruption of the neutron star must be computed by numerical relativity, though one can get a first cut at information about it by uh, doing a Newtonian treatment of the uh, star, uh, putting on tidal gravitational fields that are treated in a Newtonian manner, but that are inferred from uh, the, uh, from the space-time metric uh, for the black hole. And so we will be studying post-Newtonian techniques of computing gravitational waves, and we'll be also discussing uh, numerical relativity. Uh, neutron star, neutron star in files are a similar story. Once again, these are thought to form from main sequence progenitors in the field and also by capture binaries and globular clusters. In this case, we actually have sp uh, known examples of both uh, in our own galaxy though the final mergers are sufficiently infrequent that in order for us to have a, any hope of seeing these over the lifetime of LIGO, one has to look out into distant galaxies. Uh, in the case of neutron star black hole binaries and black hole black hole binaries, we have no clean examples of such objects. We simply infer from astrophysical phenomenology, uh, from observations, uh, and, and then uh, combining them with theory that these things should exist. But in this case, we have good examples and we can use those examples in our own galaxies to get uh, estimate event rates uh, more reliably with higher confidence than we can with the other sources. 
This is also a source that lies in the high frequency band. We'll go after it with LIGO and its partners. The reason it's the high frequency band, of course, is that because the masses involved are uh, a few solar masses. Uh, the low frequency band is up at masses of, of a million solar masses or so. Rates, the initial interferometers should see this, see this source out to 20 megaparsecs. Uh, uh, Vicky Calagera gives event rate estimates between one every 3,000 years and one every three years. So again, the same story as with the other sources. Advanced interferometers, we should see to 300 megaparsecs, estimated rates between about one per year and about three per day. The information carried by the waves, the in-spiral, again, the masses, the spins, and the orbit of the system. The merger waves, as we will see when we look at this in detail, are probably going to be lost in LIGO's high frequency noise. Though the onset of merger might just barely be visible to LIGO, and from the onset of merger, we could begin to do uh, nuclear physics uh, once again. Science to be done. Uh, in this, uh, these kinds of systems and in the black hole neutron star and black hole black hole systems, this in spiral phase, uh, where we will get our strongest signals in this case, there are a, a wide variety of interesting relativistic effects to be seen. For example, uh, we will surely see the tails of the effects of tails of gravitational waves. When, when this uh, binary system orbiting around and around emits gravitational waves, uh, some of the waves, as they're traveling out from the system through the transition zone, from the near zone to the far zone, get scattered back into the system in the process of trying to come out. And that produces a tail, that is a piece of the gravitational wave field that does not propagate at the speed of light because it's gone out and been scattered back in. When it gets scat get scattered back in, it interacts with the binary and changes the rate of inspiral of the binary. binary. And so it influences the radiation reaction uh, in a manner that should stick out very strongly in the observational data, uh, as Eric Poisson, uh, who was a postdoc here a few years ago, showed. We also have a shot at seeing the tails of the tails of the waves. <laughs> is the tail then tries to get back out, and it backscatters once again. And so we will surely see the tails of the waves. We have a shot at seeing the tails of the tails of the waves. We will almost certainly see effects of dragging of inertial frames by the spins of uh, black holes and neutron stars. Um, so uh, we will go after then a variety of interesting relativistic effects, general relativistic effects that have never been seen before. Spinning neutron stars. Uh, will also emit gravitational waves if they have deviations from axial symmetry, that is, deviations from symmetry around the spin axis. Then these deviations, you can think of it as a mountain on the neutron star, if you wish. Uh, as the star uh, spins around and around, the mountain on the neutron star radiates. And uh, so we look for, the, uh, for, that, for that emission. Um, one example of a type of spinning neutron star that's well known to electromagnetic observers is pulsars. Uh, pulsars are studied primarily uh, in the radio, but some pulsars are seen in the optical or even in gamma rays. Um, and so pulsars, and, uh, oh, and, and let me say, these pulsars then that we will go after, in this case, there will be pulsars in our own galaxy. All the other sources I've talked about are in distant galaxies. But there are huge numbers of pulsars in our own galaxy, and so we will go after the waves from those pulsars. Those waves are very weak uh, compared to the waves from a neutron star binary or a black hole binary. And so although the source is far closer, uh, it's uh, still going, likely to be tough to see these waves. Frequency band and detectors, again, this is the, in the high frequency band, so you go after this with LIGO and its partners. Detectability, the strength of the waves is governed by how big the mountains are, or mathematically governed by the ellipticity or the quadrupole moment associated with the, uh, the star, how much it deviates from, from axial symmetry. Uh, ellipticities, the theory of ellipticities in neutron star matter, uh, where the ellipticity has to be produced by uh, by uh, crustal deformations that uh, can withstand, withstand uh, the gravitational force that tries to make the star axisymmetric, or it has to be produced by magnetic uh, uh, pressures that are anisotropic. The theory says that the electricities probably don't get any bigger than about 10 to the minus 6 or possibly 10 to the minus 5. So those are very small 
And we will come, we will, when we study the phenomenology of this source, we will study why those ellipticities are thought not to get any bigger than this. Um, the, if you look over here, I have drawn curves of how strong the waves would be for a source at 10 kiloparsecs distance. 10 kiloparsecs is 30,000 uh, light years. That's about the distance from the Earth to the center of the galaxy. So at a typical distance for a typical pulsar, uh, ellipticity of 10 to the minus 5 at 10 kiloparsecs uh, would give wave strengths along here, 10 to the minus 6 along there, 10 to the minus 7 along here. Uh, and so uh, we have a, uh, uh, where I have plotted these curves at a height such that the height above uh, the noise curve, you remember these curves here are noise curves for advanced LIGO detectors, these are the noise curves for the first LIGO detectors, the height of a signal above a noise curve is the signal to noise ratio that you would get using optimal signal processing techniques or using the best techniques that we know how to use going after this source. Um, in the case where we have a specific source that we know where it is on the sky, we have uh, seen it electromagnetically. Even in that case, optimal signal processing by match filtering, where you cross-correlate a, a filter with, uh, with the source, or uh, uh, cannot be achieved because pulsars are restless animals. They, they uh, don't spin, they spin down and they spin down with a lot of irregularity. And so uh, the signal to noise ratios here are actually worse than you would get if you could do uh, matched filtering properly. Um, Teviot Creighton and Patrick Brady, who were po uh, when Teviot was a grad student in, in our group and uh, Patrick was a, a postdoc. They uh, developed the search techniques that, we that would be used uh, in place of ideal matched filtering uh, in view of uh, the restlessness of pulsars and the unpredictability of their spin downs. And they then estimated how uh, much we would lose in signal to noise ratio because we couldn't do ideal matched filtering. And that loss was rather substantial. I've forgotten what it is, but I think it's like between a factor of 5 and a factor of 20, something like that. So it's a substantial loss. And these signal to noise ratios would be bigger if uh, uh, we uh, didn't have that loss. OK, okay. Uh, let me just a second back up. I'm having, trying to re remember on this. I'm sorry. These signal to noise ratios are for the case where you know the, where the pulsar is. Uh, on the sky, and so you don't have to do search. Let me back up. There are two things that get in the way of, of uh, finding these signals. One is the thing I talked about in terms of the spin down. The second thing is that there are Doppler corrections due to the Earth's motion around the sun uh, that, and uh, the spin of the Earth and the motion around the moon that depend on where the source is on the sky. And so you have to have different Doppler corrections for different directions of the, on the sky. These signal noise ratios are for the case where you know where the source is on the sky, so you don't lose because of that. You only lose because of the uh, unpredictability, the restlessness, as I recall. And then it's worse if uh, you have, are doing all sky search. But, I, but I've actually forgotten at the moment for absolute sure how I plotted these particular curves. Yeah, John? Is there an implied integration time? Pardon? Is there an implied integration time? Yeah, so the implied integration time is a year, but you don't gain a lot after a time of about a week. You, uh, you gain much more slowly after a time of about a week because you can't do the coherent integrations. Okay. And so and that's what's been worked out by Teviot and Patrick. And so um, this, this curve is taken from one of the documents that uh, I have given to you as possible reading, the document done. Uh, science with the advanced LIGO interferometers. And so you'll see in there a, a more precise statement of just how the curve was constructed. And my, my memory from about a year and a half ago when I did this, I'm not 100% sure. Um, but the bottom line is that uh, the uh, first interferometers don't have much chance of seeing gravitational waves from uh, pulsars, but the advanced interferometers do have a reasonable chance of doing seeing it. We just don't know how large the ellipticities are, and so there's a, a very big uncertainty here. If we do see the waves from pulsars, then uh, the waves 
uh, will include uh, waves emitted at the spin frequency and at twice the spin frequency. And whenever there is a star quake, a, uh, a sudden change in the spin rate of the star due to some readjustment of the internal structure, and these things are seen uh, by astronomers electromagnetically, whenever there's a star quake, by uh, monitoring how, this, how th uh, the wave's uh, frequency changes with time after the star quake, and if you can do simultaneous electromagnetic observations, if you have an electromagnetic, uh, if you've identified the same pulsar electromagnetically, by comparing the uh, gravitational evolution of the, uh, of the frequency with the electromagnetic evolution of the frequency, and they may be uh, a little bit different after a star quake, you can learn a fair amount about neutron star structure. Um, methods of analyzing, of computing the waves from this source, uh, pulsars generally spin at spin rates that are small compared to how fast, uh, compared to the speed of light. That is, the spin rate at the surface is small compared to the speed of light. They would fly apart otherwise. Uh, but they have a strong, relativistically strong internal gravity. And so you can compute the waves from this source using a slow motion approximation to general relativity while maintaining a fully uh, relativistic gravity treatment. Uh, but the fact that you have one small parameter, V over C, uh, spin velocity divided by speed of light, that enables you to uh, analyze these sources far more easily than if you had no small parameters at all. Um, a second kind of spinning neutron star that we'll go after is what is called a low-mass X-ray binary. Again, these are things in our own galaxy. Uh, what these sources are is a neutron star that's spinning. It has a companion normal star that uh, the normal star uh, phenomenologically one sees in these sources has a mass that is small. That is a mass that's down around a solar mass or less. Uh, and the neutron star is pulling gas off of its companion, and so there's an accretion disk. And the gas then is falling down onto the neutron star after working its way inward through the accretion disk. What, and uh, when it lands on the neutron star, it should feed angular momentum into the neutron star. It should torque the neutron star up. And so you would have expected that these stars would spin at spin rates uh, that were close to breakup, but they don't. They have spin rates that are between about 250 and about 700 uh, revolutions per second. And breakup would be up above 1,000 revolutions per second. Uh, the most widely uh, respected uh, of various ways to explain this uh, is a theory due to Lars Bildstein, who's at uh, the ITP in Santa Barbara, which says that these stars have some uh, deviation from axial symmetry, mountains on them of some sort. And the faster the star spins, the stronger these uh, lumps will radiate uh, gravitational waves, and the stronger then they will try to spin the star back down. And so the star then spins up until it reaches a point where the torque due to gravitational wave emission is uh, being counterbalanced by the torque due to accretion. Uh, and then it just sits there at, uh, at that spin rate. If this is true, then it's uh, really very nice uh, that uh, in, then in a steady state, when you have this balance going on, if you think it through, you discover then that the gravitational wave strength uh, is directly proportional to the X-ray luminosity. Because the X-ray luminosity, which is produced uh, from the gas that is accreting, is proportional to the rate of accretion of mass, which in turn is proportional to the rate of accretion of angular momentum, which in turn is proportional to the rate at which angular momentum has to be radiated, which in turn is proportional to the uh, strength of the gravitational waves. And the factors of one over r distance to the source uh, are the same in both cases. And so you don't even need to know the distance to the source. You can infer from the x-ray luminosity immediately you can infer, infer the gravitational wave strength. So you just look at these sources. And from the known X-ray fluxes, you figure out the gravitational wave strength. SCOX1 is a lovely source. It would give a large signal-to-noise ratio uh, in the uh, initial interferometers. Um, the, in the, uh, I'm sorry, in the advanced interferometers, if they are narrow-banded. Um, and then there are a number of others that might be just barely detectable. Again, this is discussed in some detail. In, 
in that uh, uh, science uh, for advanced inter uh, LIGO interferometers uh, paper that I uh, uh, put on the web. From the combined gravitational electromagnetic observations of this source, we can get information about the uh, strength of the crust of the neutron star, uh, the structure, the neutron star structure, uh, crustal structure, the temperature dependence of viscosity, a number of different things about uh, neutron star physics. Yeah. What's the binary theory in systems like this? Um, it's long. I mean, it's it. Let me, let me back up. It's days, but I don't know how. I don't know how how many days. They're still passing mass, even though they're not. Yeah. Very close. Yeah. Well, well, uh, days is a. No, let me back up. It might be hours. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, these were not intended. These are supposed to all come on at once. Let me just bring everything up. Okay. Uh, when neutron stars are born uh, in supernova explosions, uh, they may sometimes be born spinning very fast. Uh, and if they're born spinning very fast, then there is a instability called an R-mode instability uh, that may occur in these stars. This is a fascinating instability, and we will study the theory of it, uh, it because it, it illustrates some interesting physics uh, in, that is quite general, but a general relativistic version of some rather general physics. Key issue is that the, these modes of oscillation of the neutron star are modes in which the material undergoes a circulatory motion like that without much density change. And so what is emitted is not mass quadrupole radiation, it's current quadrupole radiation, the analog of magnetic quadrupole radiation electromagnetically. The mass quadrupole radiation is suppressed. And so this is an example where what you might at first think was the dominant radiation is not. Now, uh, as the star spins in these instabilities, the, uh, this a pattern of oscillation uh, moves backward relative to the surface of the star with an angular velocity that is approximately the spin angular velocity divided by three. So as seen in an inertial reference frame, your frame and mine, the pattern is dragged forward at two-thirds the angular velocity of the stellar material. But as seen by the stellar material, it is dragged backwards. Now, the fact that it's dragged forward, as seen by you and me, means that angular momentum is radiated in such a way as to try to spin the star down. Okay. Because it's, uh, it's lumps, it's basically, well, it's uh, current lumps that are going around and around like that. And so the uh, radiation reaction force pushes back. But if from the point of view of the star, these lumps to which the push is coupled, they are already going backward. And they're getting pushed backward in the same direction as they're already going from the point of view of the star. And that means that uh, the work that is being done on them actually uh, increases the strength of the lumps. They gain energy. Because from their point of view, the relevant measure of energy is how, what they are doing relative to the underlying material in the star. So the lumps grow stronger and stronger as the gravitational waves are radiated. Radiation reaction amplifies uh, the lumps. Uh, and uh, ultimately, some process inside the star has to halt the growth. Otherwise, uh, the star would fly. The, these oscillations would become so huge, the star would fly apart. And so we will look at the issues of what kinds of processes inside uh, a a uh, newborn neutron star would halt the growth of these R-mode oscillations. Um, the most recent estimates uh, suge uh, suggest uh, that these oscillations may not grow strong enough to uh, actually be detected by LIGO, but that's unclear. For the last several years, it was thought that they would, and recent work uh, by uh, Lee Lindblom here, here at Caltech and Ben Owen at Milwaukee suggests uh, uh, that they may not because of an a internal viscosity process that's, occurs, that's associated with hyperon formation, so new fundamental nuclear physics issues. And then there is ongoing work at Cornell in the group of Saul Tikulski uh, that suggests that mode-mode coupling between these modes of oscillation and other modes 
might also damp out uh, these oscillations before they get really strong. But that's very preliminary work that uh, that Tchaikovsky and company are not talking about yet in public. This isn't public, so. Okay. Um, so there are issues of physics complexity, what stops the growth of sloshing at what amplitude, and, and so forth and so on. I've listed some of them here. If we see the ways from this source, uh, then obviously we go after learning about these physics complexities. And so again, you see there's a lot of interesting astrophysical phenomenology uh, involved in the gravitational wave sources. Uh, now, compact binaries in our own galaxy. Um, let me get. <laughs> are something that we will go after uh, with LISA. Now these are binaries uh, that are going around and around but not spiraling together rapidly. LIGO only sees the final phase of in-spiral and merger of black hole and neutron star binaries. Here we're talking about black hole, black hole binaries in our own galaxy, not in distant galaxies. And so in our own galaxy, since the merger rate is maybe one every 10,000 or 100,000 years, then the strongest of these sources in our own galaxy is, still has another 10,000 or 100,000 years to go until it merges. And so it's sitting out in the Lisa band, going around and around with uh, periods of, of the order of an hour. Similarly for neutron star, neutron star, and white dwarf, white dwarf binaries. Black hole, black hole binaries in our own galaxy, we will uh, be able, when we see these, and they should lie roughly in here relative to the Lisa noise curve. When we see them uh, from, from the observations, we should be able to actually predict what the merger rate is in our own galaxy. And then uh, LIGO will by then have already seen mergers in other galaxies, and we'll know whether merger rate is the same in our galaxy as it is in other galaxies. Neutron star studies uh, sim similarly study the merger rates. Uh, white dwarf, white dwarf binaries. Uh, here are some examples. Uh, uh, neutron star, neutron star in here. White dwarf, white dwarf are here. These are some other white dwarf, white dwarfs. Uh, there, are, uh, there is a stochastic background of gravitational waves that will plague LISA that sticks up above the LISA noise curve produced by white dwarf, white dwarf binaries. And about 3,000 individual white dwarf binaries will stick up above that noise curve, and there will be a lot of very rich science to be done with those 3,000 individual binaries that we ha hope to be able to see. Yeah. How many black hole, black hole in spirals do you have to see in our galaxy in order to get a rate? Or do you see none that do it? Well, you won't see any in spirals, but you will see a bl a black hole, black hole binaries, and you will see uh, the, the ins you will see the period and the time rate of change of period, and so you will infer how long it will be until they will merge. Well, I think if you see, if, once you've seen one, you, you, you uh, since, since the strongest waves are likely to be from the uh, ones that have the least time to go, once you've seen one, you have a number, an estimate. Now, at the present time, for neutron star, neutron star binaries. Uh, there are, th uh, I think, three known neutron star, neutron star binaries in our galaxy that have been seen electromagnetically as pulsars, uh, from which we have uh, uh, numbers for uh, how long it will be until they merge. Three of them for which that, that merger time is less than the age of the universe. And it is from those three that we get this highly reliable information. I, I, I say highly reliable sarcastically. Highly reliable information. The best information we have about any source comes from the three known in, uh, inspiraling neutron star binaries in our own galaxy uh, that are seen optically. They're seen optically. So we will do a similar thing gravitationally with LISA, but with, with, with lots larger numbers. Yeah. Um, let's just go on. So let me finally say something about cosmological sources. Uh, this is just a little diagram to remind you about uh, radiation coming off the Big Bang. The cosmic microwave background of photons uh, brings us a picture of what the universe was like at age 100,000 years 
before that time, uh, the uh, uh, plasma of the early universe was so hot and so dense that photons couldn't propagate. And so the last scattering of the photons off the uh, primordial plasma was at age 100,000 years, and that's what we study then, uh, looking at uh, the cosmic microwave background. If and when we someday detect neutrinos from the Big Bang, they will bring us a picture of what the universe was like when it was one second old. Uh, earlier than that, the universe is optically thick, opaque to neutrinos. Gravitational waves, the uh, the theoretical estimates suggest that gravitational waves should never have been significantly absorbed or scattered by hot plasma, hot material in the very early universe, going all the way back to the Planck era when space and time were being created according to quantum cosmology. And so gravitational waves are our only tool for directly probing the first one second of the life of the universe and hopefully probing back uh, to all the way to the Planck era. Gravitational waves, however, although they don't interact uh, with matter significantly in the very early universe, uh, they do get significantly uh, uh, scattered and amplified by the interaction with the background space-time curvature of the early universe. In uh, the LIGO frequency band, this interaction with the background space-time curvature ends when the universe was 10 to the minus 25 seconds old. And after that, these waves propagated freely. And what we see coming off the Big Bang will be, a, a, will be influenced by what actually came off out of the Planck era, together with what happened in the first 10 to the minus 25 seconds of the age of the universe in the LIGO band. In the LISA band, it's for the first something like 10 to the minus 15 seconds. And so ultimately, we're going to be going after uh, primordial gravitational waves in an attempt to probe what the physics in the extremely early universe. Um, so this discusses this issue of amplification of waves uh, uh, by actually by inflation in the very, of the universe in the very early universe. And we will work out the theory of that amplification through the, uh, pardon? You've got a problem? Our, I can't hear you. 